Let's, let's encourage everyone to interrupt me with questions. I think part of the nice thing of having a, a small group is it's nice to be able to, to have some discussion. I'm going to talk about some uh, joint work with Lee Gao, who's at uh, UMass Amherst, on stable internet routing without global coordination. And really, the, the main purpose of this talk is to discuss what happens when interdomain routing meets the unavoidable economic realities of running a large distributed network that has tens of thousands of different independent entities, some of whom are business competitors with one another. And the main point of this talk is that the economic incentives that drive how these different entities configure their routers has a very basic first order effect on how the routing protocol behaves. Something as basic as whether the protocol converges. And in fact, what we're going to show is that the internet routing system uh, is stable precisely because of those economic incentives, which is kind of an interesting result. So I'm going to start with a little bit of an overview of the internet, uh, interdomain routing architecture, talk about the convergence problem, and introduce a bit of a formal model of, of uh, interdomain routing convergence, and then talk about what kind of routing policy constraints will keep a system that's not intrinsically stable, uh, what, what would, would be, it need to be able to be made stable by those constraints. And I'll describe the, the theoretical results that we have that if those constraints hold, that the system actually will converge. And I'll talk about some empirical results that suggest, in fact, those constraints are, are true in practice. And then I'm going to end with a little bit of discussion at the end about where economics belongs in the routing system. And what we'll see in this talk is economics exists in a very funny part of the routing system, not directly in the protocols, but in how the protocols are configured. And it's not all that clear that's exactly the right place that the economic factor should come in. And so we'll talk a little bit about should they move deeper into the protocols or even further away. Uh, from the routing protocols. So at a high level, the internet consists of around 20,000 or so so-called autonomous systems. And these are basically collections of routers and links that are run by a single institution. Could be a large service provider like AT&T, could be a small company, it could be a university like Rutgers or Princeton. And in fact, there really is a hierarchy of these autonomous systems with a small number of so-called tier one providers at the top that have national or even international scope for their networks medium-sized regional providers that might cover a state or a small country, and then at the edge, a lot of universities and corporate networks. And just to give you a sense of numbers, there are around a dozen to 20 of these and maybe 15,000 of these. So out of the 20,000 or so, the vast majority are these, these nodes at the periphery that represent individual small entities that are connecting to the internet. So each of these domains is autonomous, as the name suggests. They don't want to share their topological detail. And in fact, for scaling reasons, you probably wouldn't want them to. Uh, but they do have to interact to coordinate routing because the vast majority of traffic in the internet goes between a source and a destination in different ASs. And to get that, the internet to be glued together, you need actually some amount of coordination. And that's where uh, the border gateway protocol comes in that I'll talk about in a moment. So this is a pretty typical picture, traffic from a web server on one part of the internet, hopping through maybe a half dozen of these autonomous systems, usually kind of starting from a small company or university, maybe going to a regional provider, up to a national or international provider and back down. And the size of the clouds matters. Typically, these tier one providers are much bigger and also fairly richly connected with one another. Okay? And so the, the job of intra-domain routing is going to be to pick this path at this level of clouds. And in fact, for convenience, I'm going to ignore the fact that there's any structure inside here at all. So for this entire talk, think of an AS as a single node. Not entirely realistic, but it won't, it won't matter for the, the issues we're going to be talking about. And in practice, maybe many routers, and in fact, the larger domains connect to one another, often in a half dozen or more uh, different geographic locations. But for pur our purposes, we'll think of a graph with a node corresponding to an AS and two nodes sharing a link between them if they connect at one or more places. Okay. So how does the Border Gateway Protocol work? So BGP is an unusual protocol. It's, it's a path vector policy-based protocol. And what I mean by that is autonomous systems exchange information about what destinations they can reach, and what path they are using to reach that destination. So the routes are advertised at the level of address blocks, so that the interdomain routing system doesn't care about the individual 32-bit IP addresses. It really is talking about aggregates of these uh, blocks. So usually around 200,000 today of these separate address blocks. A domain will advertise that it's able to reach that address block. Here, all addresses starting with 12.34.158 all those 256 addresses that start with those three octets. Autonomous System 2 will get that, and if it picks that route as best, it'll send its data traffic in the reverse direction to any of the destinations in that block. Now, it also has the option of advertising that information onward to AS3, 
saying, hey, you can go through two, through one to get to this destination. So each AS, it will add itself at the front of the path, and you'll end up with a sequence of autonomous system numbers leading from the center of the traffic all the way back to the destination. Does it yeah. happen on an industry basis, or it's done overnight, like, like Google is just crawling all the way? Ah, great question. So this would be done, uh, in, so BGP is an incremental protocol. So in theory, if the internet were entirely stable, it would happen a single time. Now in practice, if a link fails, this information gets withdrawn because that path is dead and re-advertised when the path comes up. So there's still quite a bit of churn. Just to give you an example, on AT&T's network, we'd see maybe 2 million messages a day. But you know, again, over 200,000 prefixes over a day. So not a ton of messages, but, uh, but definitely any time there's any change in either the topology or the policies that the operators are using to decide which path they like better might lead to a message taking place. Any other questions about, about the way the, the protocol itself works? So the thing that's interesting about BGP, BGP itself is a relatively simple protocol. You receive a message, you add yourself to the front of the message, and you, you continue to pass that routing message on. Data traffic goes in the reverse direction. The only thing that's really interesting about BGP as a protocol is, is the routing policies. Routes are not picked based on shortest paths, and there's no obligation to tell your neighbor the path that you're using. Okay, and that, that's where it's really interesting. In other words, Autonomous System 2 might prefer a longer path over this direct one. Why? Because maybe this path has bad performance, maybe this path is not revenue generating, maybe it makes more money going the other way. It may not tell AS3 about it because maybe it doesn't have a business relationship to, that includes allowing AS3 to get to AS1. Okay, I'll go into more detail about this in a moment, but imagine if this is Rutgers AT&T Sprint, Rutgers would expect AT&T to tell Sprint how to reach it, otherwise all of Sprint's customers can't reach Rutgers. Now, if this is UUNet AT&T Sprint, well, at and not in the business of letting UUNet and Sprint communicate for free. And so the decision of whether to use a path and whether to export it, to let other people traverse that path through you, depend entirely on business relationships and economic, other economic factors. And that's going to be the crux of the point of this talk, is in fact, you could have quite an arbitrary set of policies ranging from shortest path routing to very, very bizarre contorted things, but in practice, the policies depend on the economics. Yeah? This isn't necessarily in depth, but I don't know. So is, is BGP is what implemented on networks, and so where is shortest path routing that we learn about in our textbooks? Ah, great question. So since I'm talking really about routing only between domains, oh. BGP is used between each of the autonomous systems in the internet, so it's sort of the de facto glue. If you think of it as an interworking protocol, internetworking protocol is running there, and the shortest path protocols are running inside the cloud to compute the shortest path from an entry point in this network to an exit point that connects to the neighboring network. So link state protocols, if you're familiar with OSPF or ISIS, would typically run on the inside of the cloud, and, and BGP would run between the clouds. Yeah. Any other question about that? So. So what's, what's the big deal about interdomain routing? So the number of prefixes is really large. So there's a lot of scalability challenges. You could argue BGP is one of the largest distributed systems man has ever built. Right? There's millions of routers. We don't even really know how many. Precisely because the autonomous systems are hiding the detail inside of them, we don't even really know how big the internet actually is. Uh, you can tell the slide is perhaps several months old because my numbers are lower than what I said a moment ago. Right, we're almost up to 200,000 prefixes and around 20,000 ASs now, and these numbers just keep on increasing. We don't even know how many routers or paths there might be. Uh, the policies can be quite diverse. So the second thing that's interesting about BGP is the flexibility the operator has in defining how the routers pick paths and who they tell them to. And then the part that I'm most interested in here is the routing protocol convergence. If a failure happens, a policy changes, and the routers have to reach a new agreement on which way to forward traffic, how long does it take, and do they ever agree? I'm more concerned about the latter question. But just to, to note, the time of convergence is actually a problem as well. It's not uncommon for it to take minutes for the routers to stabilize on what paths they're going to use once a failure or policy change happens. Do you have a question? No. Now, the thing I'm more interested in is it doesn't even necessarily converge at all. In other words, the routers may continually send messages to one another, not ever reaching agreement on which way is the right way to forward traffic. So I want to give an illustration of this, and they're just to, to formalize this to make it a little easier to talk about, uh, Tim Griffin and Gordon Wolfong uh, at Bell Labs at the time 
had a really nice model called the stable pass problem that describes, in essence, the problem BGP is trying to solve. And so I'm going to illustrate that through this simple example where the nodes here are ASs and the edges are the links between them. And I'm listing all the paths that they're willing to tell each other about. So here, AS3 at some time might learn the path 310 from its neighbor 1. At other times, it might learn the direct path 30. The rule is at any given time, you can only pick amongst the paths your neighbors have told you. It's a single path protocol. Your neighbors only tell you the route they're using, if at all. So AS3 can't use the path 310 unless 1 is using the path 10 and chooses to tell him about it. So essentially, every node is going to pick the highest ranked path, its most preferred path, out of the paths its neighbors have told him. So I've listed the paths here in the order of preference. And so if you think about how this might look, at the very beginning, autonomous system, sorry, autonomous system 1 only knows about his own direct path, and so he picks it. He doesn't pick 1, 2, 0 because he hasn't even learned from 2 that that path exists. AS3 learns about that. He's very happy because his first choice is available. For some reason, he prefers the path 310 over his direct path. AS2 is unhappy because the path 230 is not exported to him because 3 is not using the path 30. And it's stuck using its second favorite choice. That's all well and good, but now Autonomous System 1 learns a path he prefers better than the one he was using before. So he switches. It withdrawing, in fact, the path 10 that he had told 3 about earlier. Now 3 is unhappy, and he has to switch to his second preferred choice. But unfortunately, that makes 2 happy. And the cycle continues. And in fact, actually, I've got almost an hour, right? I can keep going? OK. <laughs> now this will go on indefinitely, right? So this system has no stable solution. But where did the, 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 the ASs get the sort of priori preference? Yeah. So in some sense, in this particular model, it's an abstraction of what their policies were for picking and exporting routes. So you could imagine that 3 has assigned a rule that says my direct path has lower preference. Like maybe I'm treating this as a backup path, or it's low bandwidth, or it's expensive. And so he has a preference rule that I pick paths through 1, let's say over paths through 0. And that's, there's a language that the router vendors offer that you can write if-then-else statements of fairly arbitrary complexity, saying I like these kind of paths with these path elements in it. Like you can write regular expressions and say, gee, I like these kinds better than those. And likewise for exporting. So for example, here, for whatever reason, when path AS1 is using the path 120, he's not telling 3 about it. So he may have a policy that says, well, paths that go through AS2, I never tell AS3 about. And so that's all codified statically in these uh, configuration files that are loaded in the routers. So that the Exactly. And in fact, what I'm going to show in most of the rest of this talk is that this example is nonsense, because it's very hard to come up with any economic reason why this would happen. Right, exactly. So I'm going to basically, I heard Tim's talk, and the thing I found intriguing about it was when I saw this example, I'm like, why would this happen? In fact, I kind of hinted at it already. I said, well, gee, 3 thinks this is a backup link. But that mean, the way I've drawn it, everybody thinks this is a backup link. It doesn't make sense. I mean, Rutgers wouldn't go to three parties and say, I want all of you to be my backup provider and none of you to be my primary. Right? And so most of the work here is going to be about showing that, although conceptually BGP can oscillate, in practice it's not sensible that it would. Yeah? So just one more clarification. I don't know if you already said this. So what is the time scale at which you think something like this happens? Ah, that's a great question. So in theory, it could be on a pretty small time scale. But in practice, there are timers that the protocol implementations use that dictate that messages don't propagate, say, more than once every 30 seconds. So this might, this whole cycle might take several minutes to manifest itself, one, one change at a time. And in practice, because people do worry about instability, there are also additional things that look for oscillation-like behavior. If you but see... It's still routing between the, which is the, which is the main routing. Exactly. It's still between the AS and the problem. Yeah. So that can happen in, in like, as often as 30 seconds. Exactly. Right. The messages typically exchange around a 30-second time scale. Now, there are mechanisms that the routers have to dampen excessive messages. If for a long period of time, you're continuing to hear from your neighbor new routes over and over again, you suspect some sort of equipment failure or instability somewhere. There are mechanisms to eventually stop and, and suppress the information. That's problematic, though, because all of these routes are unstable. And if you suppress all of them, you have no route. So you could imagine this happening on the time scale of minutes. And you can imagine sort of engineering mechanisms to try to suppress it. But they're all problematic because they just slow down the oscillation, but don't really get rid of it. Good question. Yeah? So, I mean, like, imagine the policy change that take an autonomous system, but mm -hmm. 
So there, there are standard mechanisms. Actually, different router vendors uh, implement them differently. And they're highly configurable. So they're, they're best common practices for how to do it. Uh, in fact, I was just at a meeting with some network operators yesterday. And in fact, they actually disagree on whether you should have, even turn on those mechanisms. So AT&T does, UUNet doesn't. You know, so there's not only differences across vendors, but there's even differences across ISPs and whether they apply, apply the practices I just mentioned. Yeah, so it's funny, right? There's so there's so much uh, autonomousness here, if you will, right? That there's really no no enforcement for anything being being standardized, except for the protocol itself to have the message format be standardized. Even the configuration language that tells you which routes you like and don't is not standardized. Juniper has a different one than Cisco, and you know people have certain practices that they tend to use for configuring, but there, there's not a requirement that they be done the same way. So it makes it a very funny space. I mean, the, it really makes you realize the name autonomous system is really quite apt, actually, because these domains really are extremely independent. OK, so this oscillation is problematic. Just to, to say a little bit about another result that was in uh, Gordon Wolfong and Tim Griffin's paper. They looked at, well, gee, what if we had all the information about this system? Could we prove that there is a risk of an oscillation? And so in other words, what this would involve is you create a global registry of every domain, say, who they connect to and what policies they have for which routes they like and don't, and who they tell routes about. And then you'd run some sort of algorithm on this data to determine if there were conflicts, and then you'd find the parties involved in the conflict, and you'd have them work it out. OK, this, this is really broken for a lot of reasons that uh, their paper outlined. First of all, a registry like this is very hard to keep up to date. Right? And in fact, even more basic things about registries of who own which address blocks in the internet are incomplete and out of date. And this is something even more ambitious. Second thing, as, as we'll talk more about in a moment, these routing policies are directly related to people's business relationships. They relate directly to who pays money to whom. Okay, so people don't want to divulge them. And in fact, they're considered to be uh, proprietary information. So a more intellectual argument, even if you had all of this information, is an NP-complete problem to check if there's going to be a conflict of the policies. And it gets worse, because if you delete an edge or delete a node, you have to rerun the checks. In other words, a system that's safe may become unsafe as soon as an edge fails. So in fact, it's NP-complete to check any one setting of the graph, and then every subgraph of that graph has to be checked independently. So basically, just this, this is impossible for a variety of practical and computational reasons. Very strong negative result. So what we were interested in was stepping back and saying, can we find a positive result that doesn't require global coordination? Now, naturally, it's going to have to involve restricting what people can do, because we can't get around the fact that these oscillations can happen if people are free to do whatever they want. So we wanted to look for restrictions that were sufficient to avoid oscillation, but were hopefully not so onerous that operators wouldn't implement them. Okay, so our goal was basically to still preserve as much flexibility as we could. These local policies matter. We can't afford to make people do shortest path routing, for example. We don't want people to have to divulge their policies because those are our business secrets. We don't want to change the protocol. And we want to know that we have a guarantee of convergence, even if edges or nodes in the system fail. And basically, what I'm going to do is outline three assumptions I'm going to make. And I'll argue that they're sufficient to get rid of this problem and that they're actually quite practical. First one is I'm going to restrict which kind of paths you can prefer over others, based on which ones are more revenue generating for you. I'm going to restrict who you can tell about those routes, again, based on, on business relationships. And I'm going to also make one assumption about the structure of the global graph. I'm going to argue that together, these three assumptions will make the problem go away. So the main thing in, in all of this is what kind of business relationships do people in practice implement with these protocols? So the most common one is the customer-provider relationship. This is the relationship Princeton has to AT&T and Rutgers has to AT&T. Basically, that Princeton pays AT&T for connectivity to the internet. And that means two things. Princeton expects all of its destinations to be reachable from the outside world through AT&T and expects that at t will tell it how to reach destinations in the rest of the internet. So if you take the first case, Princeton has a destination D. It tells at t about it. It expects at t to tell all of its neighbors. Otherwise, these neighbors of at t won't know how to get to Princeton. And that would keep traffic from flowing in the reverse direction to Princeton. So there's no restriction there. It's basically expecting complete uh, export of all that information. The reverse direction is a little more interesting. at t knows how to reach some destination. It tells Princeton. It expects that Princeton will only tell its own downstream customers. Princeton's not in the business, business of providing transit service to AT&T. Right? So Princeton connects to US LEC and to uh, 
the local cable company in town, but it doesn't let AT&T go through Princeton to reach those destinations. It only lets AT&T uh, be reached from the Princeton Regional Schools, the Princeton Public Library, the McCarter Theater, all of these local nonprofits in town can go through Princeton to get to AT&T, but none of Princeton's other providers can. Okay, so that's the first restriction I'm making, is that Princeton is selective in how it exports. It exports down to its own customers and not sideways to parties of sort of comparable uh, size and scope of Princeton. It's really shoving things down only to its own customers. Any, any questions about that? It's just a customer to AT&T. So Princeton does have an AS number, and it does have customers. Now, granted, its customers are, you know, like the high school, you know, as opposed to being uh, an ISP or another larger university. But yeah, it has an AS number, and, it, and I'm just really referring to the relationship it has with the node above it. And this could recurse, where the things Princeton tells its downstream would only be told to, to the downstreams of that node. So that, that, that relationship is about, people guess, I mean, it's hard to know for sure, about 90% of the business relationship in the internet fall roughly in this category. And I, I hedge on the exact numbers because we don't know, actually, the, the global graph and what policies people actually apply. But the work people have done in inferring business relationships have tended to find around 90% of the edges have that kind of relationship. The other common relationship is called a peer-peer relationship. It's the kind of relationship uh, at and and Sprint have. Uh, and that relationship is really for the mutual benefit of these two domains to allow them to reach each other's customers but nobody else. Okay, in other words, Princeton uh, knows that AT&T will help others reach it. That means AT&T will tell Sprint how to reach Princeton, but Sprint will only tell Sprint's own customers. It won't tell Unionet, Level 3, all of these other big players. And that allows traffic in the reverse direction uh, to reach Rutgers and Princeton. Right? So in other words, they're allowing each other's customers to transit through them, but that edge can't be used by AT&T's uh, other peers. And if AT&T had other providers, it couldn't be used by that either. So this model in the U.S. typically is implemented as what's called settlement-free peering. No money. AT&T and Sprint need this link because they can't reach each other's customers without it. So they consider it mutually advantageous. They exchange roughly equal traffic volumes. They roughly, both get roughly equal value. No money. Just an agreement to use it in this restricted way. Okay, so now I've made a second assumption about export, that peers don't export each other's routes to their other peers and providers. So suppose uh, Sprint was not as large as AT&T, and there's a really tiny conference. Could AT&T still make such agreements? So that's, that's actually really interesting. So there, there is evidence that in Europe this model is a little less restrictive than what I just outlined, where I kind of said, well, gee, if they differ, like, you know, by a factor of more than 1.5, if they differed in traffic volume, AT&T would try to get Sprint to be a customer and not a peer. Apparently in Europe, these models are a little bit more uh, mushy, where if the volumes are a little out of whack, I might just have what's called paid peering. In other words, the routing policy is the same, but there might be a little bit of flow of money to make up for the imbalance in the traffic flow. There's no particularly compelling reason why you wouldn't do that, right? Because these two models I outlined are kind of extreme. It's not really clear why you wouldn't have things in between. And for whatever reason, it does seem like in Europe uh, that's a more common model. I think the idea is that if, if there's more traffic, see, it is a little murky because it depends on, if you think of the world in eyeballs and content, you think, well, gee, I want my eyeballs to be able to reach the content. And so you would think if I'm getting more content from you than you are from me, I should pay you. But it gets a little funny if, if you know, you're also getting revenue from content providers, not just from eyeball providers. And so it does, it does potentially get a little murky which way that should go. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, I, I kind of talked about this as, as being done primarily for reachability. In other words, if this edge didn't exist, Rutgers and Princeton couldn't communicate. Okay, so that, that's a very basic need for this edge. These kind of edges exist lower in the hierarchy of the Internet. Uh, for example, Princeton and Rutgers could decide to peer. Princeton peers with the local cable company, just as an example. Princeton and Rutgers, if we have a lot of traffic going between us, why should Princeton pay AT&T for that traffic and then Rutgers pay Sprint? Right? When we have a direct link, neither of us would pay. Right, so if we exchange a lot of traffic with one another, we might save money by creating a peering edge of our own. In this case, purely for performance and financial reasons, not, not because we couldn't reach each other. Yeah, but that would involve maybe physically switching cable in your fiber, right? I mean, that's a lot going from one platform. Exactly, or, or provisioning a circuit 
uh, from from some regional provider like you know get Verizon to, to hook us up. Exactly. So this ends up being, again, an economic question. So, for example, the local cable company in the town of Princeton peers with the campus because faculty and staff that live in town, you know, that way they avoid having both sides have to pay their upstreams. But uh, that's purely, I know, I imagine if it w that's probably easy because they're close to one another. But th you're right, there's an economic trade-off even in whether that link is truly free. Princeton would expect AT&T to tell everyone at AT&T's level that uh, Princeton is there. Uh, is that feasible? Is, I mean, is the number of uh, peers at AT&T's level uh, yeah. able to send that much information to everyone? Yeah, and they, they do. And, you, and but what, you, what you raise is, is an important point. It, it implies that these nodes at the top, like AT&T and Sprint, have to form a clique. right? AT&T and UUNet have to peer. Sprint and UUNet have to peer. Level 3 has to peer with each of these. Because, because they don't actually provide this transit service with one another, the internet wouldn't be connected, even though the graph would be connected, unless they actually fully peer. And so at the top, you could view the top of the internet as a, a clique of sort of 12 to 20 ASs that, that have this kind of a peering-like relationship. Yeah. So don't you think there's this between an economic outcome? Uh, it's like a, mm -hmm. a business outcome with no particular justification other than someone said, you know what, we're not going to do this, and, and then right. they will yeah, so one thing that's a, uh, narrow about the result I'm going to describe is it does depend on this current reality. And there's nothing about BGP that, that made this reality happen. Right? You could do a lot of other business relationships besides these two. And in fact, it would be very interesting to understand why it happened like this, because it's not necessarily intrinsic that it had to. Yeah. So that, I'll talk in a moment. The, 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 the guidelines or assumptions, depending on how you look at this work, you could either view them as descriptive and say, well, this is the reality we have now. and this is why the system is stable. The other way to look at it is as guidelines, saying if you're going to start to deviate from these economic models, you may think you're making the network more robust or more efficient, but you might be making it unstable. In which case, then these are guidelines rather than assumptions. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any other question about, the, about that? Okay. I think one, one other point. There's been a lot of interesting work recently on trying to discover the structure of these graphs. Uh, and one thing that's tricky about that is this edge is very hard to measure. If I run a probe from Princeton to Rutgers, I'll see it. But other parts of the internet will not. Right? So it actually ends up being very difficult to know how many edges there are in the graph. And particularly, the peering edges are immensely difficult to see. Especially, Princeton and Rutgers set up a peering edge between them. Nobody in the internet will see it, except a machine at Rutgers talking to a machine at Princeton, or vice versa. So it tends to mean that understanding even the basic structure of the graph proves quite difficult, precisely because these edges are used in a very selective way. So the, the additional assumption I want to make is that the relationship between a provider and a customer is a hierarchical one. In other words, my customer's customer is not my provider. Princeton's a customer of AT&T. Princeton Public Schools is a customer of the Princeton campus. But the Princeton Public School is not the provider of AT&T. Okay, so I'm disallowing directed edges. We're here, a directed edge is going from provider to customer. I'm disallowing there to ever be a cycle on that graph. Now, I argue that that's reasonable because the flow of money, it doesn't make sense for the flow of money to go in a loop like that. So finally, the last assumption I want to make is about which route you pick when you have more than one choice. So, so far I've talked about the structure of the graph and who tells what routes to whom. Now if you have more than one path, some through a customer, some through a peer, some through a provider, which one do you pick? And I'm going to assume that if I learned a route from my customer, I'm going to pick it, rather than a route learned from one of my peers or providers, even if the path is longer. Okay, and this is consistent with people's business incentives because those paths are revenue generating. I send bits to, through a customer, I earn money. I send bits through a peer, at best I'm neutral. I might even tilt the balance of power with my peer. And if I send uh, bits through a provider, I'm probably being charged for it. So sending things in some ways down the hierarchy makes, makes a lot of sense because it's revenue generating. And in fact, that's the purpose of those edges is to exactly to support uh, the customer going to and from the provider uh, with its traffic. So that's the final assumption I want to make, is that when you have a choice, you prefer a route through a customer. So three assumptions. I export routes based on the relationships with my neighbors. Uh, I pick paths that are going through my customer whenever possible. And the provider-customer relationship is asynchronous. Going yep. through your customer is so diverse to the scale of the nature of the internet, right? And you would go through larger and larger and larger hubs. Mm -hmm. 
So if, if I'm going, oh, that, that's a good question. So I would go through my customer to reach the destinations my customer can reach. But my customer won't have exported to me, like this guy here won't have told me how to reach. Right, so you won't tell V how to reach that node. So you raise a really valid point. It's true that if I, I, if I use this node to get anywhere, I would be doing this funny, what's called a valley in, in the graph. But because you doesn't tell me about those routes, I shouldn't be ever having any of those routes at my disposal. So I'm just picking amongst the routes he tells me. But you raise a really valid point that's a, a difficult security issue in BGP, which is if my customer screws up and accidentally tells me about that, I will pick it. Right, and there have been a few incidents like that where a large service provider, including one that one or more of us might have worked for at some point, uh, have done that. They've preferred the route through their customer and their customer told them how to reach the entire internet. And you've got you know, a large ISP routing to all destinations in the internet through a serial link to a low bandwidth customer. Okay, that has happened and that's a risk of, of decoupling, if you will, the exporting and selecting of routes. So you're sort of counting on your customer not to make a mistake like that. Yeah, yeah, so you bring up a couple good points. The first one is that the paths are being selected primarily based on my business relationship with just my immediate neighbor. And it's not based on load. And the protocol itself passes no capacity information, no load information, no performance information. And so to the extent performance and load factor into this, it's done in an outer loop. Like, for example, this guy might have routes through two customers, one performing better than the other. It might measure that go back into the router and say, well, of these two, I prefer this path because it has better performance. But that's sort of uh, not intrinsic in the protocol. It's done as an outer loop and reconfiguring, if you will, the tie breaking between which of those two customer routes I might pick. Yeah. And in fact, we wanted to leave latitude for that. So in fact, we said, well, gee, you have to prefer customer routes over peer routes, but I don't want to restrict amongst my customer routes which one I prefer. I would like load balancing goals, performance goals to be able to dictate that. I'm just requiring that, and likewise, amongst peer and provider routes, I can pick either one. It's just that I have to prefer the customer route if one is available. And so basically what we get from that, and I'm just going to uh, give a brief sketch of, of the proof, is we can guarantee if those three assumptions hold that the system will converge to a unique and stable solution, including when the graph changes due to failures. And so I'm just going to really briefly walk through why that works and where the assumptions come in. So I'm going to pretend in it for a moment that I can pick what order the routers make their decisions. And I'll explain in a moment later why I can generalize uh, to asynchronous routers talking to one another. I'm going to assume that the destination advertises itself, and I'm going to one at a time visit each of the routers in the graph. And I'm going to show that the routers won't change their mind when they learn about other paths later. So in particular, take the destination D. Its two upstream providers are equipped to pick based only on this information, because they'll never pick a provider route or a peer route over a customer route. So once this route is known to them, they'll pick it and they'll never leave it. Right? Because they, by definition, actually prefer that route over anything else they might later learn. Likewise, Autonomous System 3, once 1 and 2 has made their choices, is equipped to pick amongst those two paths, whichever he prefers, because nothing he'll learn later will ever change his mind. Because he'll always prefer those routes over the routes he's going to learn from his other neighbors. And so the argument is if we percolate the information up from customer to provider, up the customer provider hierarchy, we can essentially figure out all the answers that the routers are going to pick. And they'll never change their mind. Once they've done that, you can imagine flipping that around in the reverse direction and start at the top of the hierarchy of the internet and go back down. Once the router learns something from his neighbors and picks, nothing his downstream neighbors do will ever make him change his mind. Okay, it's kind of a high level sketch, there's a lot more uh, formal proof in the paper, but the basic argument is. Because of the restrictions on exporting and the restrictions on preferences, we know that there will never be information learned at a later stage that will cause someone to change their mind. Okay. And what's interesting about this, this particular proof is it's also constructive. And I'll explain later in the talk why that's interesting. If we did have the global information about the policies and the graph, we could, from this algorithm, predict what routes everybody in the internet would pick. Now, in interdomain routing, we don't have that luxury. Often inside an AS or inside a set of ASs owned by one company, we do. And so that algorithm is embodied in some traffic engineering tools inside AT&T because they can figure out inside their own domain how BGP routes are going to propagate around using a very similar kind of model. Okay, so that's sort of a high level, high level sketch of the proof. So I, I alluded this earlier. How do you interpret this result? So one way to interpret it is this is purely descriptive. These business relationships are an artifact of the way the internet has evolved, right? as was mentioned earlier. And therefore, all these assumptions are just describing common practice. 
And therefore, the system is stable because all these assumptions are true already. And in fact, empirical results are suggestive that that's true. So we looked at a lot of BGP message traces. I mentioned you know, 2 million a day inside AT&T. And we looked for evidence of oscillations. The first thing we found was that the vast majority of destinations have no routing change for almost two weeks at a time. Amazon.com, Google.com, you know, CNN.com, all the prefixes that carry the vast majority of traffic in the internet actually don't have routing changes at all. So if an oscillation was happening, you'd expect that there would be routing changes, and they're not. Now, that said, where are these two million updates a day coming from? They're highly concentrated in a small number of very unpopular and very unstable destinations. In fact, you could kind of question what the causality of that is. You know, maybe they're so unstable you can't actually successfully send traffic to them. Doesn't receive much traffic. So here we joined the routing protocol message data with traffic measurements from, from NetFlow. And we basically looked at the destinations in terms of the volume of traffic they receive and whether they happen to have a lot of updates or not very many. And so the ones that receive the vast majority of the traffic actually are disproportionately stable. And the opposite is true as well. The ones that are unstable are disproportionately unpopular. So then they won't affect the internet at all, right? Exactly. Right. And in fact, it's, it's more than that. You would still say, well, gee, are these ones oscillating? It's a reasonable question. Maybe you don't care because it doesn't carry much traffic. But in fact, what we found is that the message sequence would end with the destination being completely unreachable. So the destination would fail. And then later it would come back up and then fail. And so it didn't appear to be oscillation inside the protocol. It appeared to be the equipment actually going up and down. In other words, not a policy conflict, but a legitimate uh, flaky link that's going between up and down. So it suggested both that the oscillation isn't really happening, and to the extent there's a lot of churn, it's concentrated where it doesn't really matter. Badly, badly managed uh, destinations that connect to the internet, maybe in one place with flaky equipment. So when you use the word destination, you mean Or I mean, I was a little sloppy, a destination prefix, an address block, one of these 200,000 address blocks. So we saw in the AT&T data maybe a couple of dozen destination prefixes that were responsible for like message. Yeah, yeah, that are turning every 45 seconds or every 30 seconds, that whatever the number was I mentioned earlier. So they're basically boom, 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 boom. You know, the equipment's just going up, down, up, down, up, down. So yeah. what's the total number of destination prefixes? Around 200K. Yeah, around 200K. And a few dozen are at any given time in this sort of. Exactly. Now, I mean, one can a ask interesting questions now about how much overhead they're putting on the routers to handle all these messages. And it's kind of an interesting question that could you get people to be more stable by charging them money for all the updates they're sending? And there have been people that said, you know, I didn't, I'm not getting any money for processing these messages and storing your routes. Right? So there's another economic issue hiding there, right? that these unstable guys are actually uh, making the routers work hard, but they're not affecting the traffic in any significant way. So anyway, this is by no means a proof that there's no oscillation, but it's certainly suggestive that there's no oscillation. And in turn, that's suggestive that perhaps the assumptions that we're making hold, which I agree is a tenuous argument, but it's the best we can do without, uh, without public information about the actual routing policies. Uh, the second argument is that, well, gee, if everybody followed these guidelines that are generally pretty reasonable, it would make the internet stable. And so the other way of looking at this is that we should encourage operators to obey these guidelines and to convince them that it's not really against their best interest to do so. And in fact, provide tools to them to make sure that they really are correctly configuring their routers. So that's all well and good, but okay. I, I, as we talked about a little earlier, I oversimplified the model a bit in requiring just these two business relationships. So the next thing we did, we started looking at re relaxing those three assumptions in interesting ways. And the, the high level punchline is whenever we relax one of those three assumptions, we'd find a counterexample where the system would oscillate. And then we'd have to tighten one or more of the other two assumptions to make the system continue to work. And so it suggests there's actually a family of different sets of assumptions we can make that balance path selection, path export, and whether you're willing to assume something about the global structure of the graph. All right, so one example. Uh, some ISPs really do want to prefer a shorter route through a peer over a longer route through a customer, right? Because maybe it makes more efficient use of resources, has better performance. If you want to do that, I can show the system will, will potentially oscillate. But if I add an additional assumption about the graph, that my customer's customer is never my peer. There are no cycles of combined provider, customer, and peer edges. If I'm willing to add that assumption, I'm again OK. So depending on how willing you are to think that wouldn't happen, I'm reasonably, I think it's kind of unusual that that would happen. You could afford to relax the assumption and say, well, I just prefer customer routes when they're shorter, right? which seems pretty reasonable because they're both shorter and revenue generating. And the beat goes on. 
there are a lot of different variations on the theme here. I'm just going to touch on one more, which is backup relationships. Now, a, lot of IS, a lot of ISPs and a lot of uh, stub networks like Rutgers and Princeton have more than one provider. Right? So how do they decide which way they're going to use those two providers? In some cases, one of the two providers is a very low bandwidth connection. And so in fact, you may prefer your backup provider to route around through to your primary provider rather than losing, using that very low bandwidth connection to you. And that would violate my assumption that you prefer routes to your customer. In this case, Rutgers is paying Sprint, for example, not to route through it unless the failure of the other, other provider's link happens. Similarly, two peers might decide to let each other use each other's provider when the primary link fails. For example, Harvard and Harvard Business School have a relationship like this, where Harvard connects, I think, to AT&T and Harvard Business School to Sprint. Each of them use the other when they lose their connectivity through their primary provider. Again, that violates my assumptions in that I'm now allowing exporting of a route learned from a peer up the hierarchy. So again, I can show that that'll oscillate. And that's important because that is a practice people are starting to do. So that if I now add an additional assumption that I've. Well, it wouldn't oscillate unless, if you put in some, some mechanism that says A is for failure and only then there's this exception. Right. And you could come up with fairly contorted examples where that'll cause an oscillation. I, I think it's extremely unlikely. But you can come up with examples that are similar to that funny gadget I showed at the very beginning, where three peers of one another have a link to a common customer, and they disagree over which path is the right one to use. Now, I can get around that if I have everybody prefer paths with fewer backup links over paths with more, which kind of makes sense, right? Why would I want to route through a path with seven backup edges in it when I've got a path with no backup edges? And so again, the same argument happens over and over again. I've got to find ways to relax one assumption I have to tighten. Uh, one of the other assumptions. So I'm just going to conclude uh, this piece of the talk. I have a few more slides on just some other, other aspects of, of economics in, uh, in interdomain routing. Again, the key things here are these three assumptions about the structure of the graph, who I tell about the routes I've picked, and which routes I use when I've got more than one choice. And the nice thing is this doesn't require global coordination. It's locally implementable. It doesn't change BGP. It doesn't change the decision process. It doesn't change the routers. And it provably guarantees that you converge to a unique and stable solution. And most importantly, because the rest are, are meaningless if this weren't true, people have a business incentive to do this already. So in fact, again, I think the primary way to view this work is descriptive. It's the reason why the internet doesn't oscillate, as opposed to a guideline from uh, keeping it from oscillating. So some, some follow-up work that, that we and others have, have done on this or that I wanted to just briefly touch on. Uh, I mentioned briefly earlier, people have been trying to infer these business relationships, right? They're secret. Right, but people want to know what they are because they have business value. So what's really uh, interesting about that, well, first of all, people have tried to design, uh, figure out the fundamental limits. I mentioned you, know, you relax one assumption, you have to strengthen another. People have tried to formalize that and, and outline the rest of the space. So a really interesting paper at SIGCOM a year ago, um, people said, well, what if I don't want to ever restrict exporting? I'm an ISP. I get to export routing information to whoever I choose. If you do that, you can show you have to do shortest path routing amongst the routes you learn if you want to provably avoid oscillation. So actually, a fairly damning negative result that says if you don't restrict exporting, you have to have some fairly strong assumption elsewhere to keep the system stable. Kind of unfortunate, because you'd like, in fact, to relax that assumption a bit. Uh, second thing, I mentioned earlier, um, the AS really is a large number of nodes on the inside. at and you know, 600 to 1,000 or so routers, they all speak BGP2, right? Because they all connect to different neighbors, and they have to share amongst themselves what they've learned from the outside. So they speak a variant of BGP called internal BGP. And that can oscillate for the same reason, if the internal routers are in disagreement about what preferences to put on paths. So in fact, the work was extended to come up with sufficient conditions, very similar to the ones I just outlined, for how internal routers should pick amongst the routes they learn from one another. And the fact that the proof was constructive is important because that, that actually allows you, in the internal case, you know the graph, you know the policies, you can predict what routes every node will pick. And that, that's useful for being able to do what-if analysis of traffic flow in the network, particularly for doing things like traffic engineering. The, the last two things are more about actually figuring out what these relationships actually are. Uh, Lishan Gao, my co-author on the work I'm describing, has a really interesting paper of which the basic insight is very cute. The policies imply which paths you pick. And so you can look at the paths people pick and invert that to figure out what their policies were. Simple idea, path ABC. Do you see it? In trace route and public data that you look at, it implies B was willing to let A go through it to get to C. Right? That implies it isn't AT&T Sprint UUNet. 
satisfied because that, that violates the, the exporting rules, right? And so if you take a lot of paths and look at the sets of three nodes in a row and all those paths, that provides a set of constraints on what business relationship all the nodes might have had. And so there's been a, an interesting body of work on just using all the data, working backwards to figure out the business relationships, which actually has a lot of uh, value in characterizing the AS graph and how it's evolved. Uh, it also has a fair amount of business value, which is to say, well, gee, UUNet treats that guy as a customer. Why am I treating him as a peer? Just as an arbitrary example. Um, a second thing relates to the point you brought up earlier, which is what if my customer tells me routes through his providers like he's not supposed to do? You can design protective filters that will block some of your information from your customers if you think it violates the business relationship. You could presuppose what they should not be telling you. And when they do, drop it. So that you're not at risk of routing the entire internet through a serial link to one of your customers who misconfigured his router. No, no, it's a sufficient condition. So we know that the business relationships imply the system will converge, but it, it's not a, not a necessary condition. And that's actually been across the board in all this work, including the, this other follow-up studies. There's a lot of stuff here that's primarily sufficient conditions. People have had a hard time finding ne necessary conditions. Yeah, did you have a question? Ah, that's interesting. You can't the yeah. An even more modest way to do that uh, is that there are public repositories of BGP measurement data, and uh, UUNet used to participate in them, and they pulled out because, in fact, they perceived not not just because of this kind of inference work, but in general, people were getting a lot of intelligence out of the data. And granted, it's still not the same thing as knowing for sure. Like you can't publish it and say UUNet you know, treats AOL as a provider or something like that. You can't really say it because you don't know for certain that it's true, but there's still a lot of actionable information you can extract from the data. So there have been uh, questions about participation in public repositories because of, because of the business value that, so, uh, that data has. Work on uh, filtering such data for privacy purposes or preserving? Yeah, that's a really great question. Actually, there's been a lot of work on privacy preserving data analysis recently, and particularly things like you know doing set intersect and set union operations in a way that doesn't divulge information. I think some of these problems about relationship inference or root cause analysis, can I figure out where something is broken in the internet without access to the data? And so being able to do local analysis on the BGP data in each domain and apply algorithms like that actually I think is really, would be really cool. It seems like a perfect area to apply those kind of algorithms because it's exactly an area where people don't want to divulge. And the volume of data is still pretty big also. So there might be scale reasons you might want to not, not divulge the data. Yeah. Any other question about, the, about this piece? Yeah, just, it also has a negative side effect that we just can't get it over the 90% of folks in the country. Yeah. Sure. And it's tricky because even though there are uh, public repositories that have you know, dozens to maybe a low, low, yeah, like a little less than 100 feeds, you still don't really know what you're not seeing. And so they're not really good models to tell us what we're missing when we lose, lose, uh, lose data. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about other, other issues in, in economic incentives and in, in interdomain routing just in the last few minutes. Um, this came up really early in the talk as a question, and I think it's a really interesting problem. How did this all happen? Right? How is it that we ended up with these two types of business relationships as the dominant ones? And how did these relationships form uh, over time? Right? You select a peer because you need them for connectivity to parts of the internet you don't have other ways to reach or to reduce transit costs. You select a provider because you need reliability. You, hopefully, they offer you lower cost or, or better performance, and often because they're physically uh, close to you and having a, a point of presence nearby. So why not have a model where peers are not settlement free, that maybe one pays the other when they need the other guy a little bit more? It would be interesting to model what, if and when that makes sense. Uh, deep peering. This has happened a few times, very high profile ways. Two tier one ISPs disagree on whether they should continue to be peers. And eventually, they play chicken and terminate the, the relationship. Parts of the internet now partitioned from one another uh, during that time. Uh, there have been some FCC studies about whether peers have an incentive to have bad performance on the links between them because they can steal each other's customers by saying to Rutgers, well, hey, if you leave Sprint and come to AT&T, you can get better performance to Princeton. Right? Uh, I don't know if Rutgers would find that compelling or not, but 
so in theory, you could imagine them in general not having an incentive to upgrade the link. I mean, you're right, you could do micro things micro. where you, here, here I'm thinking more like why should Sprint and AT&T upgrade the links between them? They're not revenue generating. They have to spend money to install the links and they get no revenue. And they in fact do get revenue from stealing each other's customers. Right? The so. only reason it'll be that instead of direct customers is that they have a very uh, wide uh, set down. They can reach anywhere. Exactly. So it's tricky, right? Because if you make the performance bad, you can lose customers. But if you make it bad, you might be able to steal other customers away. So it's a delicate issue. So there's an FCC study actually worrying about whether the tier ones uh, might have an incentive to do this and whether there need to be regulatory uh, constraints. Right, and you, you certainly could imagine if you had good ways to diagnose whose fault it was that the performance is bad, then you could perhaps you know, ascribe blame when things like that happen and actually cause people not to want to do it because they, they lose more value by being blamed potentially for doing it. Um, there, there's also uh, issues where the business relationships are more nuanced than what I mentioned, where uh, maybe an American ISP and a European ISP are peers in Europe, but my, the European one might be the customer of the U.S. one inside the U.S. So these relationships can actually vary depending on the, on the proportion of the world that you're actually in. In, in selecting a provider, there are other interesting economic issues. Often uh, a, a customer will multi-home to more than one provider, not purely for reliability reasons, but also to be able to play billing model games. You know, for example, if one provider has great performance but charges a lot of money, you can send your traffic through the cheap, badly performing network for the vast majority of the time that the performance is fine and only use the good provider when the other guy can't give good performance. And depending on how the billing models are set up, there might be a strong incentive for the edge to do that. There also are starting to be third-party aggregators where you can actually connect to a third party a lot of smaller networks that can now go to the big boys and ask for a better billing relationship and potentially connect to more than one upstream provider uh, to game against them. And so there are companies like Equinix and Internap and so on that are in that space as well to serve as aggregators. There's not been very much work in modeling these things. People know that these are common practices, but there's not really much of a sort of a more formal model to explain uh, how these things happen. Okay. Uh, another, another example, just to, to touch on a couple more, providers really connect in multiple geographic locations, maybe you know six to a dozen across the country both for reliability reasons and performance reasons. And so there's a common practice called hot potato or early exit routing, where each of these two providers have an incentive to get the traffic out of their network as quickly as they can, rather than consuming national fiber, you know, backhaul fiber across the country. All right, so AT&T in New York would dump the traffic uh, into Sprint in New York and force Sprint to carry it across the country to California. Right? But the problem is Sprint is doing that too in the reverse direction. So two consequences here that are interesting. One is that paths in the internet are often asymmetric because of this, right? Because the person who has the packet gets to decide where to dump it. So the sender, the sender, sending ISP gets to pick in, uh, in each of the two directions. The other thing that's annoying about this is it might be mutually advantageous to both of these ISPs if both directions of the traffic went through the middle. It might consume less resources in aggregate and the performance might be better. Mm -hmm. So I think some of it is, is the inability to coordinate, right? Because there's no mechanism for doing the coordination. And even if there were, it's a little tricky to design it so that ne neither side can game the other. And I think it, it, uh, it wouldn't be as over-provisioned if people were sending more of the traffic oh. all the way across. But I think your point's well taken. It's not always obvious the earliest exit point is really strictly important. The way the router is implemented, but you're right, maybe the second closest exit point is, you know, who, do I really care that much? But in the absence of more information, so some of this is about missing information. I think your point's well taken. They might not be quite that mean to one another. They might just also partially lack the information that would help them optimize these choices better. In one direction. Right. That could be. I mean, A, A is taking a hit in terms of resource consumption going this way instead of that way. So in some sense, it might be a need for A to be incented to do that because he's going to get benefit for the reverse traffic. Right? And if you think of it purely as a resource consumption issue rather than a, uh, than a, than a performance, performance one. Um, 
But there might be plenty of incentive for them to cooperate a little on this. Some of it's just the, the protocols aren't designed to export that kind of information. So I think it's a little unclear whether this is a competitiveness problem or an information problem. It's probably a little bit, a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, finally, uh, last one is a security one. This is actually uh, starting to become an increasingly big problem. Uh, there's no, inf not very good information about who owns which address block. There are registries that are not uniformly uh, populated or kept accurate. I think the entry for AT&T research still says Bell Labs. You know, I mean, the split happened 10 years ago. But, um, anyway, the problem here is that if Autonomous System 6 owns this address block and is telling the world about it, it's actually not that difficult for Autonomous System 1 to start denouncing it to. Right? And the parties uh, closer to it will pick that route. Actually, you and it may have been in a situation where ASs two and three actually start directing traffic to the bogus destination. Okay, why is that bad? That could be that AS might be dropping the packets on the floor, might be snooping them before redirecting them to the right destination. Worse yet, might be impersonating Bank of America or any other online banking site. So actually, in fact, there's some evidence that these techniques are being used to do uh, both identity theft and sending of spam. Right? Because it's not that difficult to do, especially you do it for a short period of time and then you let things be. Uh, sent back in the right direction, it's fairly uh, difficult actually to, uh, to enforce that people aren't doing it. Um, it does seem to happen quite a few times a day by accident. It's not hard to make a configuration mistake, especially because routers are often configured manually. Maybe this guy owns 35 and not 34 and he just fat fingered at the keyboard, right? It can cause something like this to happen. So because of the uh, lack of information, the lack of sharing, AS3 is not all that well equipped to know that one is lying. Now it could be that if some other parts of the internet were cooperating, like maybe AS5 could have told 3, hey, you know, 6 really owns this destination. But because there's not a lot of cooperation going on, actually, in fact, they're actually fairly vulnerable to misbehavior. So it's another place where, again, it might be in the economic interest of the ASs to cooperate, but the mechanism is, is, uh, is lacking. It does a bit in that you could view this as a denial of service attack if what AS1 does is drop the packets on the floor once this happens. You could view an unstable destination as a denial of service, too, because you're essentially forcing all the routers to process all the message loads. Um, there are other issues about protecting the TCP connection over which these BGP sessions run. If you can, any attack on TCP can also be an attack on keeping that session up. Yeah, so th this kind of thing is actually a fairly big concern because there's, a, there's a, a need to either have cooperation with the global authority to have accurate registries and public keys to solve this problem, or at a minimum, a need for more best common practices and informal sharing. Uh, amongst the AESs. So anyway, just to, to step back and, and close, uh, today's interdomain routing system, the economics come in in a very funny way, in part because the protocols weren't designed for a commercial environment that we live in now. The incentives are not inside the protocol or independent of the protocols. They're embedded in this funny middle ground about how the protocols are configured, an area that standards don't say much about and where best common practices and, and lawyers and <coughs> business needs all con conflate together in a funny way. And so one might argue this is very bizarre, unnatural, and uh, maybe it shouldn't have come out this way. And so there are a lot of really interesting questions that people are just starting to look at about other ways to have economics come to play here. I think it's impossible to ignore the fact that the economics are here. These autonomous entities are business entities, after all. So it's reasonable economics would matter, but it's really unclear exactly how. And just enumerate here a bunch of things. And maybe every BGP advertisement should have a price. Uh, and you should actually be able to use any route that's out there as long as you're willing to pay for it. That's one model people are looking at. And there's also other people looking at negotiation schemes where neighboring ASs coordinate uh, to be able to decide which routes to use. Any, uh, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really great question. So we're, we're just about to sell, ready to celebrate the 10th birthday of Secure BGP, which exists in standards documents, and not uh, on any router. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and these issues are, are at, the at the heart of why, right? I mean, some of it's computational. You have to do all this crypto stuff, and it's complicated. 
Some of it is about not having any registries and needing to bootstrap them. And how do you bootstrap a registry? And people at Aaron that run the North American part of the address space believe they have 60% accuracy in their registry in terms of who owns what address space. And that's an improvement after sub substantial undertaking to clean it up. Right. So how do you incent people to publish in the registry? When, I mean, if, if it were 99% participation, you start telling them 1% that aren't in there, they're not going to be reachable on the internet. And they'll publish their, their address blocks right away. But it's tricky when the, when the accuracy is so bad. So I think there is a bit of a, uh, a problem. Also, some of these protocols aren't incrementally deployable. So you kind of need to do a reboot of the internet to deploy them. And so they've been, they've, uh, been really hard. So I think this is a fascinating problem. It's actually one I'm extremely interested in. How do you come up with solutions that maybe aren't as perfect as secure BGP would be, but are actually give early adopters some concrete benefit for taking a first step. So where is the money? Like where is the money to pull back in? Inside of all these clouds or whatever, like these forensic delay or whatever the concept. Yeah, so I think you, you could view it's all bilateral and it's in some cases there is no money, like in the case of UUNet and Sprint. Yeah. And in the case of, you know, Rutgers and AT and T or, or or Princeton and AT and T, it's in some sort of contract that maybe is flat, maybe is usage based billing and maybe some combination of the two. But, but they're usually on, on some fairly coarse time scale that they're, they're actually uh, enforced and collected on. Any other questions, comments? Great, thank you. <laughs>